Welcome to our video series featuring conversations with musicians, artists, and creative people of all sorts. Episode 2 features Ricky Nye, a blues and boogie-woogie piano legend from Cincinnati. We started our conversation by talking about his weekly Facebook Live concerts. Um, the Facebook Live things have, have been so wonderful. I got people tuning in from overseas, like friends from over there. Cause I go on at seven on Saturdays, seven till eight. So if you're in, if you're in Europe, it's, it's uh, one o'clock in the morning. If uh, you're in the UK, it's midnight. So I got, I got people tuning in friends from over there and f from all around. And then now you see too, how people are doing like, um, they're doing um, Facebook uh, groups, mm -hmm. you know, for, for online uh, streaming. And um, so Man, it's, it's, it's actually, things have been wor working out much better than I expected. I didn't know what to expect. You know, I didn't know, I said, I'm just going to do this. And, um, but yeah, then, uh, I, I mean, people have just been, for, um, you know, I mean, and when it comes to donations, I don't do a hard sell, you know, it's just like, I'm, it's like, if you can, if you're in that position, great. You know, a lot of us are in the same boat, but here's some tunes. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of funny too, just, uh, how popular some songs are um that chicken a la blues it oh, seems yeah. like every week people want to hear that song sunday we ate fried chicken monday chicken wings tuesday chicken fricassee wednesday chicken i like it thursday chicken enchiladas friday chicken stew saturday we ate scrambled eggs because you know that's chicken too. Yeah, chicken's all I need. I ate so many chickens. They just cluck it all in my bone. Yeah, it's 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 funny because there's some tunes that have, that have been requested in the last few weeks that I haven't played in a long, 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 long time. Like, like, um, you know, folks are just ask for stuff like back from uh, an earlier part of my career. And, and the one, the one, the one realization that I made, and maybe you, you can relate to this, I don't know. Um, but when I, up until last week, I was taking requests like right out of the shoot, mm. you know? And then I thought, and then I thought about it. I felt like, like I'd go and listen later and say, man, I'm playing too fast. You know, I'd make these observations. I says, well, I feel like, kind of feel like I'm being chased. You know, it's like, so I says, when I go to a gig, I don't get on the bandstand and just start taking requests. So, so the, the adjustment that I made is say, I'm going to play like three tunes just, just to get, get myself organized. And then we'll open up the request lines you know that and makes total it, sense yeah and that worked out a whole lot better well how's this whole thing changed like your weekly routine because i know both of us you know we were playing what like three nights a week probably on average three well, or four I, maybe I, yeah i mean i do work for seniors and in a month i might play like maybe five one hour programs that happen during the day mm. and then i would have gigs you know might be playing like four evening gigs a week yeah, I tell you what, musically, I've just been, I've been, this is a difference to me, okay? It's like, if I go to do a, a gig, each gig is a little different, you know? Um, if I'm playing at a barbecue joint, it's not like I'm playing at the Netherland Hilton. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm playing 
in a low income nursing facility or a, a high a high end uh, affluent high rise or um, or uh, wherever wherever the, everything's a little different you know so when I'm just playing at home and I don't have any um, I don't have any prescribed plan. I find myself improvising a whole lot more just harmonically and, and um, just playing like um, just beautiful chords and just like soothing things and, and just exploring, you know, just, just um, stuff that's in my head. It's in, you know, um, I've been really liking that and I'll go and um, cause I, I went to music school back back when I was 18 and um, we use the real book if you're familiar with the the real book it's like a, like a fake book for standards and I've learned yeah. a lot of tunes out of it through time so now I'm just kind of going back and looking at these tunes and saying oh man yeah what, what is, I'll know the melody what is that called uh I start flipping through the book oh yeah yeah so I'll sit and play it you know it's like just just casual time that typically when like for us when we're running from gig to gig you know, and, and doing our little office work, it, 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 it takes up a lot of your time and, and, and takes up um, a, a certain amount of freedom, I think. Well, where do you think it's going? I mean, you know, that's, that's such a difficult question to even try to answer, but um, do you think that this whole situation will have a long-term effect on, on our part of the music business in terms of, you know, maybe you'll be doing Facebook live stuff every week as, as a regular gig from now on? Well, you know, because, because people are tuning in from overseas uh, and it's reaching that far and people from all over, I, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's like a viable platform, you know, it's like, yeah. I mean, even, even I think what you're saying is even after everything's said and done and, and we're back out in the world, mm -hmm that I think, I think it will still go on, you know? Um, the, one, the one thing, the one thing I think is, people are free to put stuff up whenever they want, but I, I like doing a set day at a set time, set start and stop time, so that it's like clockwork, you know? It's like every Wednesday at blah, blah, you know? Yeah. I do every Saturday from seven till eight. Eastern time, if you're listening to this from somewhere else. And uh, I'm just going to keep on doing it until I start to have public gigs again. You were talking about going overseas. I, I feel like of all the, the musicians I know, you have the biggest overseas following. How did you get so famous in Europe? Um, well, uh, it just, it really it just uh, happened by chance. It was no plan. It wasn't like, I'm going to go, I want to make a career in Europe. Um, a lot of a lot of my uh, path his his, his was was uh, uh, initiated by when I got invited to play at the uh, at the Arches Boogie Piano Stage at the at the Cincy Blues Fest, um, and just to, like kind of a backstory on that. So uh, I was friends with Big Joe Duskin, and there's a fella named Tom Dooley who was played in the first rock and roll bands in Cincinnati, and he plays good boogie. Um, and um, so, and, and I knew Pigmeat Jarrett back in the day, you know, Joe and, and Pigmeat. And so um, Tom, Tom had said, hey, me and my wife, we're having a New Year's Day party and we'd like to invite you. I says, okay. So um, they, they, uh, they lived on a street called La Fuel. It's like in between uh, Queen City and, and uh, Harrison. And the street is, it's kind of skeezy, you know, <laughs> but so I, 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 cause I've traveled that street before anyway. So, so we played my group, the red hots played new year's Eve and, um, and my drummer friend, I stayed at her place that evening and we stayed up very late and, um, got up the next day very late and all just kind of crusty. And I was like, eh. mm. so I says, man, I should go to this thing. But I had like overalls on and stuff. And I said, yeah. well, I don't, I didn't really know what their home was like. So I, 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 I'm driving, I'm driving up with fuel. And then all of a sudden to the left, I see like this freaking mansion. 
<laughs> with like a circular driveway. And I pull over and I'm seeing all these nicely dressed people like in their, you know, maybe in their 60s, 70s, you know. So I think, oh man, you know, I look like shooting, sh sh yeah. So I says, well, I'm just gonna go and s smile and say hi and just be nice, you know. And uh, I'll just go and say hi. And so I go in and there's a room to the left and Pigme Jarrett's playing piano in there. I'm like, wow. So I walk into the living room and there's, there's uh, Joe, there's big Joe Duskin sitting in a chair by himself. And I, and I walked in and, and I says, oh, hey, Joe, how you doing? He goes, Rick, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and about, about 10 minutes later, I'm over on playing some blues on the piano and he's sitting in a chair next to me singing. And, and, and Tom, you know, of course I, I Tom and his wife, I, I met them on the way in, in, in the house, in their home, you know? And so after about 10 minutes, Tom's playing some boogie. I, I never really knew about boogie woogie I, at all. Really. I had elements of in my playing, but so I'm just kind of playing along, you know, just kind of listening to him and kind of playing along. And so one of the, one of the guests was Dr. Phil Lemming. Uh, who who was the benefactor the, uh, for the Arches Boogie Piano Stage, and he says, "Oh, he says, um, um, you play professionally, don't you?" I says, "Yeah." I says, "Oh, I do." So he said, well, "I'd like to invite you to play at the Arches Stage this summer." I'm like, "Great," hmm. you know. So I was at the time I was playing a lot of blues and New Orleans kind of stuff and some rock and piano, but not traditional boogie woogie. Is has very specific parameters you know, rules about it. And it's, 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 you don't just hit and go, you know, it's called a boogie. So I met these specialists there and that, and then I said, Oh, I said, I want to go there. I want to, I want to, I want to figure this out. The next year, the piano, a pianist from Brussels, Belgium, his name was Renaud, R-E-N-A-U-D, Patini, which is P-A-T-I-G-N-Y, Renaud Patini. So they called him the boogie woogie demon. This mm. little, this little wiry little guy with this little scraggly beard and beady eyes, you know, and he's, he's a really funny guy. So he stayed a week after the, a week after the Arches stage, he stayed with a local guitarist named Dave Hawkins with Dave and his wife. And Dave and Renault were on the same record label out of university of Arizona. And Dave lived like two minutes from my house. Hmm. So for the whole next week, me and Renault are getting together. He's coming over. He's showing me stuff. We're hanging out. He's coming to my gigs. We just had a great, great time. And like I say, he's a real funny guy, you know. So then he invited me to come over to Europe. And, and back when you could afford airfare and everything, you know. And so he booked like six gigs. We had six one-nighters. And uh, then I started meeting people. And then he invited me uh, to his festival. And then I met other players. Um, he started inviting me to festivals. Well, Renault, just to back up a little bit, Renault was doing uh, something called Brosella Boogie Woogie. He was doing it four times a year with one other pianist. Uh, Brosella was the original name of, of Brussels. So, so he, when I put together, I put together my first Boogie Summit. I think it was in '99, just just out of the blue. Uh, a, a pianist uh, who's from England, lives in California, Carl Sonny Leyland, um, like a real uh, ins big inspiration to me and a, and a very good friend. He says, hey, me and my wife are coming in to Indianapolis for a wedding. Do you think you could book something for us around this time? Yeah, sure. He said, why don't you call Joe? Because he was friends with Big Joe, too. Yeah, so I'm thinking about what could I do? And I contact the Southgate house. And... Um, so I got a Tuesday night there and this is like, I had about five weeks to put this together. Hmm. And, and I did some work for Baldwin at the time and they provided a couple upright pianos. And, um, and then I got an email from Renault. Hey, I'm coming back to the U S I'm going to fly into Cincinnati. And I says, you're flying in the day of my show. Can I, can I have someone bring you to the show? And will you play? So now I got four piano players and, and a rhythm section uh, my upright bassist and drummer at the time. So I did it. And, and I had about 80, 90 people, you know, on a, on a, on a Tuesday night. So Renault says, he shows me a poster of one of his shows. He's got all these sponsors. Hmm. 
and everything. He says, he says, uh, he looks at my poster. He says, Oh, your poster is shit. He's like, <laughs> so he says, he shows me his poster and, and, and I says, wow. He says, so he was really into organizing and there's a lot of Europeans that are in organizing these, these, these concerts. And uh, he's like, you can do it. You know, like, I, you know, he's like, do it. You can do it. Hmm. You know, like, keep this music alive you know in the in the u.s so i said i'm gonna do it so then i i started i started doing my boogie summit um i did it for 18 years and it was always me and and three other pianists in, in rhythm section and so um i started inviting players to come over and play my show and not every player is an organizer but a lot of these europeans were so oh come over and play my show hmm. you know then along the way i I, uh, through a French friend I, I, and a pianist, I, I meet this band uh, and I start, that's who I call the Paris Blues Band. I brought them to Cincinnati, Greater Cincinnati, like four years in a row, uh, you know, several years ago. And that started that whole thing, you know? And so everything, everything just kind of happened naturally. It just, and it, it, I've had a career over there for like 20 years. So I didn't know until literally today that you didn't start with boogie woogie you're so good at it that i just assumed like it was the thing that you studied from the time you were you know eight years old learning to play the piano no i didn't i didn't know about it and i didn't really i didn't start to play it till i was like 40 years old you know that's that's crazy that style uh the thing about that style is like nobody sat down and, and showed me anything and and really, like I said, there's so many there's so many specifics about that style, it, and a lot of dualities too. Like you have to have metronomic time. You your time can't waver. It has to be like the train rolling down the tracks, you know. Mm. But it has to swing. It can't sound robotic, and it has to be powerful. But it should still have grace. Hmm. You know, and it should, it should have power and grace and it shouldn't sound brutish you know, to me, you know, and the, and the thing about it is like with any traditional style, you have to pay respect to its origins if you want to do it right and pay respect to the origins and then find your voice in that style. Anyway, I, I know I started playing music when I was five. Uh, my, my uncles and my dad had a group and my mother took me to watch him rehearse. Back when, if you had a party, you had, you had live musicians. Hmm. You didn't have a DJ. And my father played electric bass, and my uncle played a, a hollow body. A, it was a, a Gibson um, Switchmaster, the three pickup Switchmaster. It was like killer guitar. And uh, my other uncle played accordion. So you know, my, my, my uncle Earl taught music for, for a living you know, for over 60 years. And, um, said so cool old house with the big porch and had the the french doors and the stained glass and all and so mm-hmm. we go walking in to his teaching room and they're sitting there playing and i was like <laughs> it was like flipping a switch i said I, I i was five i'm like i'm gonna be a musician and i started off playing accordion and that's what kids did back then hmm. you know they had like like music um like classrooms with all these kids with little accordions and um, so, I, you know, I, and I was just way into music. I was listening to WSAI, the AM station all the time. And just, and I got to be about eight years old and I'm like, accordion is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got a really, I got a really bad sunburn. Cause even before I got the sunburn, I says, I said, dad, my God, you know, accordion is like, eh. Hmm. And he says, well, I said it's not like it's not rock and roll. He said, "Look at look at uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys." So they had they had a what's called a cordovox. It's like an electronic accordion, like an organ for accordion players. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, I got a really bad sunburn. I'm talking terrible. And Ricky, you got to go into practice. But I can't practice my shoulders. I'm so bad. You know and and then my folks found a piano. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a Baldwin Acrosonic, a suspended piano. And that's what I have. I don't have that piano, but that's what I've had, I've had for almost 25 years now. Uh, 
got this piano for like a hundred bucks. Hmm. And so then I started playing piano. Um, but I, uh, my uncle that played accordion, he uh, wound up acquiring a Hammond organ. Hmm. It was a chopped Hammond organ. So it had these pipe legs that screwed into it. And they were carrying a Leslie cabinet for people that don't know. It's a, it's like rotor speakers. And when you hit the switch, it speeds up like, like vibrato in your voice. And so, um, so he's playing organ now. And I'm like, Ooh, I like that. You know, Booker T and the MGs was yeah. out and all that good kind of stuff. And so my folks, they got a Hammond organ and a Leslie cabinet cheap, like some kind of amazing deal. Uh, and had it at the house. So I really got into playing organ. Didn't feel comfortable with the piano, like like really very much at all. Uh, piano, I didn't really know how to make, I didn't really know what to do. Because hmm. with the piano, you can't be afraid. You got to use the whole thing and you got to, you know, I just didn't really know how to approach it. Early 90s, I started feeling like I was starting to be a piano player. Um, and then when, and then when I got wise to, to, to uh, traditional boogie woogie, then it was like, I don't know. I just really felt like, what do you play piano? I'm a piano player. You know, I can, I feel like I could say that. Well, I've, I've got three questions here and then I'll let you go to Kroger, but just, okay. just real quick. Uh, one, what's your dream instrument? If, if there was one instrument in the world, you could go out and get today what would it be well i don't i don't even know i don't even know i've got a room full of uh uh vintage stuff you know that i've got like a, a farfisa combo organ and a couple worlds for electric pianos and a mini moog synthesizer oh nice you know and and um got like three digital pianos and and um and a lot of times it's about what you do with what you have that's that's true for sure, you know. Um, but you know, I mean, hey, if I had if I had a Hammond B three here, that would be great. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, next question: What is your favorite post gig meal? You know, late night after the show, whether you're cooking it yourself or going somewhere to get it. I don't know. I, I, a lot of times if I'm going to eat something like later on, be like, like some yogurt with a banana and blueberries in it, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I don't. And, and, and if, uh, if I've been visited by the devil, I might, <laughs> I might go to, um, there's a gold star that's right next to my house. There you go. I might, I might hit, I might hit that. Um, but that's that's very rarely, yeah. That would be that would be like uh, one of those kind of screw it. I'm going to gold star. <laughs> well, that that explains why why you're still looking so good and sounding so good because you're eating yogurt with you know blueberries in it instead of like deep fried you know oh, everything. Yeah. I eat pretty clean. I, I don't I don't eat meat much like hardly at all, and um, and just kind of stay away from dairy and and fried stuff. You know, so that's that's how I've been doing it for a long time. All right. So last official question. Okay. How are you doing on hand sanitizer, toilet paper, you know, all that sort of stuff that's become so valuable during this time? Are are you okay there? Yeah, well, um I yeah. Uh you know, I've just been getting by. I haven't I haven't uh I've had I've had paper products to use. So uh, when, when, uh, you know, when, when, uh, the toilet paper shelf was empty, you know, get boxes of tissues and stuff. Um, uh, and you know, the one thing that I'm, and it's, I guess I'm not doing it because I'm so careful even before this happened. Like if I'm going into somewhere, you know, um, use the doorknob, I'll be like, you know, I'll be <laughs> yeah. using this or, or whatever, um, uh, uh, or have gloves on. Uh, so I haven't I haven't been carrying hand sanitizer with me, but but big on big on the hand washing and all that stuff and 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 um, of course like the whole distancing thing. It's 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 funny because the last time I was, on, I was in a store, it's like the whole time you're like ducking and weaving. You know, it's like yeah. 
you know, you get ready to go down and I'm like, shit. Okay. And then you go, <laughs> going over to the other aisle and be like, okay. And then here comes somebody, ah, you know, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. Definitely. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, a couple of weeks ago I, I went to Kroger by my house and I was like mortified. I mean, I, I mean, I was just, I got out of there. I was like, Ugh. you know, just, <laughs> just, just, um, traumatized, you know? Well, okay, man. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for the chat. Yeah, this was fun. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. We're supported by our patrons on Patreon. Check the description for a link to that and to all the ways you can support Ricky from his website, to PayPal, to the Facebook page where you can watch his weekly live concerts. We'll see you next time. Be well.